high school coach or any coach asks the players, do you want to win or you want everyone to play? Why is a coach asking that question and what is the purpose of this question? When a coach who's coaching a team, usually this happens at the high school level or the middle school level. A coach is forced to ask this question to the players. Do you want to win or do you want everyone to play? Why is this co question asked? Any ideas? Just shout out. Looks like uh, the, the player or the players are not letting someone or some people to play with them to share. Okay, you're saying maybe to share. Okay, what else? Why else would a high school coach ask this question to the players? I it's it's the, the quality of... Uh, yeah, Sister yeah. Zahra? Sister Zahra, go ahead. Yeah, it's, we're looking, uh, he's looking for qualities uh, in order to win. But if uh, we can pick anybody to play, we are uh, putting a risk not to win uh, the game. So more of focusing on quality. Okay, very good. Someone else was also speaking. Who else would like yes, to? Yes, I was, uh, I believe the reason for the coach to ask this question probably is to clarify that the players have the clear objective of this activity. So activity itself is not as important as the objective of the activity is. So in coach's mind, he wants to um, make sure that the, the, the soldiers, the players, they know why are they doing it? What's the purpose behind this activity? So I believe this is what he wants them to know. Excellent. So the goal is more important than just to exert your time and energy. Excellent. Very good, Brother Kadir. I think that was Brother Kadir. Anybody else, one, anyone else want to chime in? Because I go back to this question at the very end. Um, I was kind of thinking along the lines of Dr. what Brother Kadir was saying. So he was asking basically what is more important, just winning is more important or every player's participation and involvement in the game is more important. Kind of. Excellent. So what's more important, winning or participation, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Now, next slide. How is a question I just asked different than the imam or the priest telling us what we want to hear or what we need to hear? It's a very, I'm drawing a connection between a high school coach because he, some high school coaches, they're forced into a position by the parents or the administration. They want everyone to play and their focus is not winning. And others say, no, uh, the you, you coach, your job is to put the best team you can on the field to give us the best chance to win. Right? So I think Sister Zara said that basically in one way, Brother Kadir said it in another way, Brother Mazur said it in another way. Uh, and the first person to speak was who? I forgot. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't write that. They said basically the same thing, the qualities you need to win. So when an imam or a priest or any religious figure, how is that different than them telling us what we want to hear versus what we need to hear? Any ideas? Now, you don't have to get it right, but just think, brainstorm. Because the whole purpose of this exercise is that by the end of it, you understand material or at least see material from a different perspective than when we started the meeting, right? You don't have to agree, but you at least are seeing the material or the question from a different perspective. Any ideas? Yes, Brother Mazer. So uh, I think Imam is going to tell what people need to hear rather than what they want to hear because the purpose there is to give them a message of Allah SWT, um, what they need to be successful in this world and in hereafter. Whereas when you're playing a game, it is basically boosting your morale by saying that it is important rather that you participate in the game and not worry about winning the game. So focus on participation. Okay, very good. Anybody else would like to chime in? There's no wrong answer. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I can say something here. Sure, sure, Sheikh Ibrahim. Uh, the, the main purpose of, of, of the khutbah should be in the mind of the imam, the khatib, and in the mind of the musalliin. The musalliin 
if they are if they want to to hear what they want and the khatib wants to please them and to bring whatever they know or whatever they like then we will not be able to change anything actually the point here of the khutbah is to change is to to have some impact in their daily life uh, if that is the case then they they have to hear what they need to not what they want it to so i believe uh, that is a big responsibility on any imam any khatib to be aware of the situation of the people to deliver something going to benefit them going to change an impact in their lives not just let's get rid of this khutbah and let's do whatever it, it, it needed and that's it okay excellent very good excellent sheikh ibrahim and, and thank you so much for joining us because your input is really really valuable okay so um I, I think you have a youngster there, Horace, next to you. Would, would, can that person read this hadith for us? Go ahead, we're mixing. Okay, she's too shy. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't have a Yusuf and Hakim to pick on today. So, uh, Usayad, are you there? Okay. All right, he's on mute. Yes, okay. I'm here. Usayad, read this hadith. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ said, Amongst the men of Bani Israel, there was a man who had murdered 99 persons. Then he set out asking whether his repentance could be accepted or not. He came upon a monk and asked him if his repentance could be accepted. The monk replied in the negative, and so the man killed him. He kept on asking till a man advised to go to such and such village. So he left for it. But, the, but death overtook him on the way. While dying... He turned his chest towards that village where he had hoped his repentance would be accepted. And so the angels of mercy and the angels of punishment quarreled amongst themselves regarding him. Allah ordered the village towards which he was going to come closer to him. And he ordered the village whence he had come to go far away. And then he ordered the angels to measure the distances between his body and the two villages. So he was found to be one span closer to the village he was going to. So he was forgiven. He was forgiven. He man who. Okay. He was forgiven. Okay. So everyone on this call, including the youngsters, have heard this hadith and heard it many times. There are 54 khutbas in a year. I would say this khutbah has probably been mentioned anywhere from 12, 15 to 18 times a year, right? Just from the khutbah. So we've all heard this hadith and we all are very familiar with it. Now, so who are the characters in this hadith? The characters, like if you were doing content analysis on the hadith, who are the characters in the hadith? The angels. Okay, very good. Who else? The angels. Excellent. Go ahead, shout out. You can talk over each other. The man. The man, the man excellent. The, 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 the man, yeah. Okay, who else? The righteous man, the uh, scholar. Two, two characters. Scholar, excellent. Okay, who else? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and now again, we have to be very careful. Definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above everything. But for the purpose of this exercise, we can say he was the chief character, okay? Yeah. Okay, very good. So this is it. There are seven characters. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second one is scholar number one. Next one is scholar number two. The angel of, there are three angels. One is the angel of mercy. One is the angel of punishment. One is the, uh, I, I'm sorry, I spelled this wrong. Angel who comes down in the form of a person in another narration and is the arbiter between the angel of mercy and the angel of punishment and then the man himself, right? So these are the seven, uh, let's say characters. And of course, I have to be very careful. I don't want to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and na'uzu billah is a character, right? Okay? But for the purpose of this exercise, I'm trying to, we, we're trying to contextualize it to understand. So the two scholars, the three angels of mercy, the man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, now, what are the themes of this hadith? Now let's critically evaluate it because we've all heard the hadith at least 50 times, 100 times, 200 times, depending on how old you are. What are the major themes of this hadith? Well, it's supposed to be the major theme is, is to show the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, when, when somebody has a, uh, an, a sincere repentance. 
Okay, exactly. I believe the um, theme to me sounds like Inna al bin that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala looks deep into your niyyah, your intention, more so than the obvious action. So if he finds out that your intention is towards the repentance, he knows it, so he honors that. So to me, the niyyah or intention is probably the theme. Excellent. Any other ideas? Never judge. Okay, don't judge. Excellent. Don't judge. Any other ideas? We have time now. Let's dig into this because, again, these hadith are so foundational in our religion, They're found, which means they should directly affect our personality, right? And our intellectual process. So that's why I want to now spend the rest of the time on what is the theme and how does it tie to the characters. So the first two, first one is the most obvious. Allah's mercy and rahmah is unlimited. The, of Allah's 99 names that we know of, first are Rahman and Rahim. We know the, the Quranic ayah that there are 100 hours of mercy and only one is pointed to this world. 99 are for the hereafter. Now, even that is just mentioned in a way which we can wrap our primitive mind around, but Allah's mercy is even greater than that, right? We, when someone passes away, we say, Ya Allah may uh, uh, have mercy. For example, there's a major uh, African-American imam. His mother never converted to Islam. And even he said, I ask Allah to have mercy on her. One of the best du'as that we can make for anybody. Like I remember speaking- Brother Asad, the... your voice is cutting up and hardly okay, hear you. Okay, sorry, hold on, hold on then. Okay, just a moment, okay. It was not, it was not cutting maybe from, from your internet, Brother Kabir. Yeah, I can hear him fine. Here's same here. I cannot hear. I cannot hear him at all. Try leaving the meeting, then joining back in. Hello, is this any better? It's, it is better now. Okay. All right. So. So sorry, sorry. So, so the, the point being made here is that Allah's Rahman is mercy based, overrides almost everything, right? The first of the 99 names of Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, right? Of when we talk of all of these, all of these things, right? Uh, Allah's Rahman, Allah's mercy, Allah's Rahman, Allah's mercy. So of course, this is a major theme in, in the religion, right? And we talk about the 99 arrows, okay? And then, as Brother Kadir said, intention. Intention, intention, intention. And we also all, I think everybody on the call also knows the hadith of the person who went to Medina for the purposes of marrying a woman. And I think it's one of the first, I think it's the fifth hadith in Imam Nabi's 40 hadith. So it's about mercy and intention, but then, and this is where we see the third thing, most people who mention this hadith will also mention knowledge of the scholars. Get your understanding of Islam from people who are legitimate scholars. Because the first person, the first scholar he gives them doesn't give them the right advice, right? Even yesterday, when the khatib spoke, he spoke specifically to this point that you, the, the first person was not well informed, so he said, you cannot be forgiven. And the second scholar he went to gave them the correct interpretation, you can be forgiven. And in most yeah. cases, this is where the explanation kind of ends. But let's dig a little deeper. This is my understanding of the themes. On the right, you have this Allah's mercy is unlimited. The intention and knowledge from scholars. But other big things is self-examination. Why did this person even go to the first scholar and ask the question? Because he was exam examining himself. He was saying, I've committed evil and sin, right? First step, he examined himself. And then when he didn't get the answer he liked, he still proceeded to try to get the answer. He didn't stop. And then when he was given the answer, 
he had self-realization. And now what does he do? When the second scholar tells him, you have to leave. He took the action right away. He took the action right away. He didn't say, I'm going to think about it. He didn't say, I, I need to think about your advice. He took the action right away. Another big theme is the environmental factors. The second scholar said, you live in a land of fitna. Definitely. You want to improve yourself, you must, cho- you must change your environmental conditions. Modern term, that's what it meant. So he is told to go to a village where there are righteous people. He said, get out of this city. And to make this understandable to some of the young people, you see sometimes there's a basketball player or a player on a team. He's not really performing and he's traded. He goes to another team and he begins to perform better, right? Usually it happens to a player who's in a big market like New York or Los Angeles. And then when they're sent to a smaller market, they actually play better in a smaller market. Why? Because there's less fitna in smaller markets. (laughs) There are less dancing bars in smaller markets, right? So environmental factors. A big part of this theme is change your physical location and your environment. Okay. Another major theme here is behavior modification. You just can't self-examine yourself. That's the first thing. Next thing is self-realization. Then you must modify your behavior. And lastly, I put your action required. And this is something I think, and this is where inshallah Sheikh Ibrahim can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of this hadith is the person starts to walk, right? He leaves. And he collapses on the way, right? In most right. narrations. And what does he do? He starts to crawl. He starts to crawl. And then he dies. So it's just not that he dies. What happens, he collapses, and then he crawls. So what is happening is, he has examined himself. He's come to self-realization. He's taking the action. And now, even when he has collapsed, he is crawling to get to that land. So his dying breath is spent in what? In trying to modify his behavior and improve himself. How sincere is that? Subhanallah. Very sincere. And so what I'm arguing here is this, is this is where the rubber meets the road. Of course, we believe in Allah's Rahmah and His mercy. Of, that's the first thing. But say that somebody is addressing this, t- this specific hadith and they have 10 minutes. They'll spend nine minutes on Allah's Rahmah and His mercy. And of course, it's important to understand that it's fundamentally part of our Akidah. None of us are entering paradise without Allah's Rahmah and His mercy. But we also need to emphasize the intention. We also need to emphasize self-examination. We also need to emphasize self-realization. We need to emphasize changing our environmental conditions. We need to modify our behavior. We need to act. What action is required as a result of this hadith? Leaving it at Allah Rahman Rahim and listen to the right scholars is not the message I want my is not enough of a message for my 16 year old. I want my 16 year old to know that this hadith demands action from you, even if you have to crawl. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is we need a more comprehensive understanding. Like when you really analyze it. So now my question here is this. If of the, of the seven characters here in the story, who are we? We're number seven, right? The man. I guess we do have one scholar here, but most of us will say we're number seven, right? So the lesson for me is primarily how number seven acts. Of course, I should understand Allah's mercy, right? And I should understand the role of the scholar. But for somebody like me, my main motivation is 
the primary, the lessons that, that I can take home that are actionable or how the man acted. So what I'm emphasizing is, this is where this, this is much more powerful than how generally we understand it. And there are multiple narrations, but they all do say this. What happens? One angel comes, angel of punishment says, this guy has committed so many crimes. He shouldn't be forgiven. The angel of mercy says, no, Allah is our Rahman our Rahim. We should forgive him. And the judge says, let's measure. And then Allah intervenes because of his infinite Rahman and mercy. But even in the narration I read, what happens? A person is dying and he turns his heart towards the purer city, the cleaner city. The emphasis is on action. So when I say what we want to hear versus what we need to hear, this is an excellent hadith. Because what we want to hear is Allah's Rahman and Rahim. But we also, what we need to really hear in this hadith is what are the demands, what are the requirements to get Allah's Rahman and His mercy. Now, Allah forgives whomever He wills. We know that. That's part of our aqidah. I'm not, I'm not speaking in a public form. Everyone here knows each other. It's not so what we want to hear is Allah's Rahman and His mercy, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it when we ask for his forgive, ask for forgiveness for our sins. But what we need to hear is what action are you taking? What behavior are you modifying? What corrective things are you doing to get that rahman the mercy? So my last slide, and I use this in, in a corporate context. If you make convenient decisions, you should expect convenient results. This man made the difficult decision. He started off, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sheikh Ibrahim, he, he went by foot, right? He didn't, he didn't have a conveyance. He didn't have an animal. Yeah, yeah he was walking. Yes. He was walking. He made the difficult decision. He said, this is what is required of me, and I'm going. And so I think this fits a lot into not just us personally, spiritually, and with our families, but even with our institutions, we want to make convenient decisions, but yet we expect excellent results. If you make convenient decisions, you should expect convenient results. If you make the difficult decisions and the dent undertake the difficult action, inshallah, you will get the results. And that doesn't mean do, why do things the hard way, why do things the easy way when there's a hard way. That's not what I'm saying in the context. So inshallah, uh, that's it. I think I have a couple of minutes. Does anyone have any comments or questions about what I just mentioned, inshallah, if Harris allows? I just wanted to say, Jazakallah khair, that's, that's a great approach. And that is, that, that kind of criticism uh, is needed. And if you, if, you, uh, if you allow me to say that, that most... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Yes, go ahead, Sheikh Ibrahim. Yeah, you, you I, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying that uh, uh, most of, of the time, uh, uh, I I love to hear the feedback from from people like Brother Asad for my khutbas because that will improve me. And uh, I have to say it this way: uh, the, the the positive uh, uh, criticism is always needed, and that's that's part of it. So, uh, uh, Subhanallah. If all the the khutaba, the khatibs knows exactly how to approach or how to, uh, what is the point? If they, that's what I, what I want to say. If they prepare well, as you mentioned, it, the, the convenient uh, uh, way or the decision will, will lead to convenient results. But if, if we take it hard, a difficult way, uh, then the results will be will be amazing. That, that is, yeah, that's that's what I wanted just to mention. Jazakallah khair. Where you come?